It's not always easy, I'll tell you, because I'm lapsing now into anecdote about my own experiences in the build-up to the Iraq War. About the, I was passionately, passionately opposed and um, was happy in Parliament thereafter to be part of that, uh, in the vanguard, I hope, of that, of that opposition. And as the build-up came, I was anxious, desperate to get on to the media in order to talk about it. Now, you may remember at the time that there was a trial going on at the Old Bailey of a man called Burrell, who was Princess Diana's um, main servant. And he was charged with stealing a large quantity, posthumously, stealing a large quantity, posthumously for her, not Burrell, stealing, <laughs> stealing a large quantity of her possessions which were found in Burrell's garage. Now, he was obviously deeply innocent because the Queen, just before he was about to be convicted, remembered that she'd given him permission to take the Irish uh, There we are, obviously a deeply innocent man. Now, that, no, that is nothing to the matter except the problems that we have to face as backbenchers. Because I was desperate to talk about Iraq, but I was known to be a Republican and a lawyer, and so the only thing that the press wanted me to go on and talk about was Burrell. So um, every time somebody phoned up, day program or whatever, and I said, yes, I want to come on and talk about Iraq, they said, no, actually, we want to talk about this butler. <laughs> so it became very frustrating. Anyway, butler was, I mean, Burrow was uh, eventually acquitted, and I thought this is going to be all right. And then you may remember, maybe you don't, but I'm going to tell you, is that a number of the royal staff in Buckingham Palace started to misbehave themselves in, um, in rather a sort of sexual way. Um, <clears throat> now, the way of the press is that they say, who is the expert on butlers? <laughs> and they said, Marshall Andrews, this is the man that we need to talk about these fornicating footmen. So, <laughs> but it went on, the whole nightmare went on as we are drifting towards war in Iraq and every time, every time the media phone me up and I say, well, yeah, certainly I want to come on, I want to talk about Iraq and they say, no, actually, actually we want you to talk about these, uh, these footmen. <laughs> so, uh, finally, finally I, 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 I cracked it and um, on Five Live I went on exactly the same they said they wanted me to do so and when I was interviewed I said, before you say anything else, I want to say to you this, that um, non-consensual male intercourse among royal ballets is almost unknown in Baghdad. <laughs> <laughs> but that is no reason to suppose that they have weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> So it's difficult, it's difficult for us, a true story, but can I, can I just finish? But the other thing is, is that what we must do, more than anything else, as backbench members of parliament, we must take seriously, seriously the power that we have, because it's not, it's not used. We have very substantial power to hold ministers to account, and we must revisit it and re, and re burnish it. And if I can finish, if I may, by telling you a story, which is an instructive story about Backbench life. Um, it's a story which reflects very well on me and, um, and very badly on the Home <coughs> Secretary at the time, Jack Straw, which is of course why I tell you uh, this, uh, this particular story. And um, let me say this, uh, this is a closed meeting, so you are, you are bound by Chatham House rules. So if you want to repeat this story outside this room, you will need my express consent in order to do so. And may I say straight away, you have it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it, uh, it began with the first assault that was mounted by this government on jury trial and the right to elect jury trial. And it came to it was mode of trial bill one, which was to effectively end the right to elect trial by jury. It was given to magistrates to decide whether you had trial by jury or not. And um, so it was a serious constitutional bill. But the government built into the bill a measure which said magistrates should take into account the reputation of the person who was in front of them in deciding whether they should have jury trial or not. Typically, if I may say so, new Labour measure. But that was what they built into it, and it was designed specifically in order to deal with the case of the elderly lady who absentmindedly walks out of W. H. Smith with a copy of Martin Amos without paying for it, or indeed with Martin Amos himself. And that was, that was, uh, that was what it was designed to do. Well, of course, those of us who were totally opposed to this assault on civil liberties immediately said this is creating two-tier justice. Justice for those that have a reputation and justice for those that do not. Well, we had a, uh, we had a terrific row. Um, uh, we organised, the Old Testament prophets organised our first rebellion 
It wasn't a bad rebellion. Of course, we had a majority of 167 to cope with, but uh, it went very well. It put lead in the Lord's pencils, and, uh, and they chucked it out, and there was a constitutional battle. Um, it worked very well, and the government retreated. So they came back with Murder Trial Bill 2. Murder Trial Bill 2 was exactly the same, except that it removed completely the reputation clause. Indeed, it said magistrates should not be able to take into account the reputation of those who were applying for jury trial. Whereupon, of course, those who were opposed to the measure said, what about the old lady who walks out of W.A. Smith <laughs> and uh, with a copy of Martin Amis? So the government cried foul, we had another rebellion. Um, but at the beginning of it, the Home Secretary said this to the House of Commons. He said, this has the support of the Lord Chief Justice and various other people, like the police, and the wood, wood. but, so I thought at the time, I thought, I wonder if it does have the support of the Lord Chief Justice. So I wrote to the Lord Chief Justice and said, can I come and see you? And he said, yeah. So I went to see him. And um, I said, um, I'm interested in this assertion, you have that's your support. And he said, um, he said, well, I can't tell you. Now, I may not have been politically up to speed, but even I can see where something's coming. So I said, why not? And he said, well, I've had correspondence with the Home Secretary, and I regard it as confidential. So I said, well, what if the Home Secretary says I can see it? He said, that'd be fine. So I said, fine, I'll write to the Home Secretary and say that you don't object to me seeing this correspondence. <laughs> Silence. Silence. Time went by, read again. Silence. Finally, the bill is coming up for its next reading. So I get in touch with Jack's office and I, and I say, um, why haven't I heard anything? And a nice man, a nice young man on the end of the phone said, I'll phone you back, which he did. And when he phoned me back, he said, it's all my fault. Absolutely all my fault. Absolutely, I can't tell you how sorry I am. That's in my part, bearing nothing to do with the Home Secretary at all. Um, I will talk to the Home Secretary. The bill's coming out the following Wednesday. I'll talk to the Home Secretary. And he'll talk to the Lord Chief Justice over the weekend. And then we'll let you have the documents. Silence. <laughs> Monday, no documents. I phone up Jack's office. I say, can I have... Ah, yes, yes. No, he's spoken to the Lord Chief Justice. Um, we'll, we'll let you have the documents. Tuesday, the letters arrive. And what it showed was that three days before Jack Straw had said to the House of Commons, this has the support of the Lord Chief Justice, not unimportant in the circumstances, the Lord Chief Justice had written to him and said, I have grave reservations about this legislation which I think would do substantial injustice. So we went to the press and uh, I gave it to one tabloid, one broadsheet. And they both said this is dynamic, dynamite. Um, we will run it on the front page. And I said, I'm very sorry to say this, the Labour government. They said, fine. That night Concord crashed. And the following day, every newspaper for the first ten pages was full of that particular tragedy, quite right. And the story about Jack Straw's mendacity to the House of Commons disappeared to below the fold on the tenth page of the Broad Street and completely from the tablet. Now I tell you this story just simply as a sort of uh, as a sort of heartwarming story in a way, <laughs> um, but, but also to indicate, and the happy ending is that the government pulled out. They scrapped the bill, the bill no longer went forward, you still have the right to elect trial by jury. It's a small, small victory, but it is still available. And so what I hope is going to uh, going to come out this is the feeling that there are, there is hope in this uh, very autocratic world that we live in, that we can at least see some light flickering away at the end of the Westminster Tunnel. But anyway, we must hold our nerve um, to quote England's greatest ever poet, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, then you have seriously underestimated the gravity of the situation. <laughs>